Welcome. Is this working? Yep, okay, good. Fortunately for you, you are not here to hear me speak today, uh, but I get the privilege of giving your introduction. So Reverend Seifu Anil Singh Malares is a global executive manager with a varied career as a corporate leader at Microsoft and as an international entrepreneur. He currently leads a nonprofit, Spiritual Directors International, is a motivational speaker, a Zen priest, and a spiritual director companion. He has had stints as a journalist, a scholar, a large event planner and director, and a nonprofit expert. He led Microsoft's International Strategic Partner Program as senior director for 12 years and has started and or runs three nonprofits, the Preeclampsia Foundation, the Compassionate Action Network, and SDI. Additionally, he has organized major international conferences, helped promising inventors value and sell their patents, co-founded a management consulting and international services firm, and advised individuals and groups on how to implement meaningful and lasting changes. Reverend Seifu Anio looks to combine the best practices from the world of business with a commitment to practical, compassionate action. He was born in Holland and raised in Europe and the United States, fluent in Spanish, French, and English. He is a citizen of both the United States and Spain. He is fortunate for his liberal arts education and cross-cultural upbringing, which helped him hone the skills he uses every day. So welcome. Oh, you can clap, yeah. And I'll just give you a quick little setup. We'll do about a 10, 15 minute speech and then we'll go into a question and answer session. So definitely write down your questions and be prepared for that. Thank you, thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah. All right. Well, it's it's great to be here, and this is uh, this is what I really love about these visits. Is from one minute to the next, I don't know who I'm going to be talking to, and and uh, so it great, uh, gives me a lot of variety, which I really uh, is is part of the reason why I've done so many of these. So I'll give you a little bit of background about myself, and then talk about. Um, the connection um, between a liberal arts education and success in the business world. I am a Socratic, so I much prefer to engage in dialogue than speechifying or lecturing, but I'll do a little bit of that, and, uh, and I'll re if I remember to repeat the questions, um, if I forget, uh, someone please remind me. So my name is Reverend Seifu um, Anil Singh Malares. I The Reverend Seifu part is because I'm a, I'm a Zen priest, I'm an ordained priest, a uh, monk, and um, I can talk a little more about that a bit later to, for any of you who are interested. I'm an international um, creature. Um, you know, my father was from India, my mother was from Spain. I was born in Holland. Um, raised in Belgium for the most part, in Brussels, although we were an international family, so we lived in India, I lived in the UK, um, and that before moving to this country in 1973 when I was age 11, which, which gives you all my age if you can do quick math. And um, my parents were both internationalists, they both worked at the United Nations, and so that very much informs my um, everything that I've done since uh, since my youth, which has always had a very strong international focus. Um, I am a product of a liberal arts education, and I'll speak about that in a little more detail, so I'll just give you an overview now. Um, my undergraduate degrees are in English literature and philosophy. Um, I have a master's degree from Harvard in comparative religions, and I was going to be an educator, and so um, was planning on doing a PhD there at Harvard, and um, got dissuaded by the politics that I saw in the two years that I, took me to get the master's, and also by the the average um, length of time that it took to complete a PhD there, which was eleven to twelve years. And so um, I didn't have the enthusiasm for that academic pursuit. And I changed directions. I was in Boston. This is 1989. 
um, and ended up running. I had translated my way through grad school, paid for my my tuition uh, and then my expenses by translating a number of books. And so I took over an institution called the Boston Language Institute in 1989 and ran it for a couple of years. Um, my ex-wife, uh, wife at the time, was from Anchorage, Alaska, and she wanted us to move closer to her hometown. And so we settled on Seattle, and she faxed my resume in 1990 to a little-known company at the time uh, named Microsoft. And she assured me, I'd never heard of Microsoft. I went, well, you know, what technology that's not really, you know, theology and uh, religions and philosophy. But she said, oh, no, no, they're looking for a group language manager. A uh, group language manager was, there was um, an international team of about 300 full-time employees at Microsoft in that um, uh, at that time, and they were looking for someone to manage the one of the three teams that was taking care of um, the first simultaneous shipment in Microsoft history, which was the release of um, one of the flagship products. There were two flagship products at Microsoft in those days. One was Windows, which had just started, Windows 3.0. And then Windows 3.1, which was released in 91 or 92, and Microsoft Works. And Microsoft Works, for those of you, and see, I can, with this crowd, I'm sure some of you remember that product. <laughs> um, it was the precursor to Microsoft Office. It was an integrated, you know, uh, word processor and, and um, you know, the, the precursor to the full-fledged suite that, that became Microsoft Office. So we shipped that in 1991 in German, French, and English, and I was managing that team um, internally. Um, probably, there's a, you know, probably a team of about 20 people, translators, language leads, terminologists, and software localizers who were adapting the code. Um, I made a pitch to Bill Gates the following year in 1992, uh, basically to outsource all of our international operations. Even in those days, we were spending something like 20 or $25 million a year and um, taking our products international, that grew very quickly. This is all public information. In 1995, with the launch of Windows 95, it was up to $100 million a year. And so um, I managed to convince uh, Bill Gates to uh, that I could reduce costs and increase quality and increase um, turnaround time. And so he empowered me to do that to lead that program for the company as a whole. So for 12 years until 2003, I was basically one of the key managers of international operations for Microsoft. Um, traveled all over the world, um, built teams in Japan, <clears throat> throughout Europe, in the Middle East, in various regions. And if any of you want to hear more about that, I am I'm happy to engage in that dialogue. Um, after 12 years in 2003, um, I was beyond burned out, and so left Microsoft, um, started a number of companies of, of my own, um, including Ecomundi, which is still running kind of in the background these days, but it's still running, um, which is an international management consulting firm and international services firm. Um, we had big clients like Mattel and IBM and, and others, Toyota and others during my tenure there. Um, and about five years ago, I decided to go back to my roots. And my roots were my study of uh, philosophy, religion, and spirituality in general. And um, so I renewed my vows, my Buddhist vows. Um, I became a priest uh, monk last year, a Zen monk, after a 40-year journey, uh, which started as a freshman at the University of Rochester in upstate New York. And um, so now I run Spiritual Directors International, and, uh, which is a group of uh, 6,600 spiritual companions worldwide. It's uh, basically psychologists for the soul is what I call it, how I describe us. And so we work with uh, those who come to us to help them get in touch with their own sense of um, either God or the universe or however they might describe, you know, in Zen we call it beyond the beyond, um, but that higher power, however they, they might 
they might um, attune to it. So that's a brief story of me. Um, I, I, I've, I've done 27, I think 27 universities or 25 universities with the Woodrow Wilson uh, Visiting Fellow Program. Um, because I'm, as, as you can tell from my resume, I'm a failed academic. And so this allows me to kind of come in like the uncle, you know, for a week and, and uh, dip my toe in and then leave before it gets dangerous. And so the number one topic across the last 14 years that I've been part of this program has been the connection between my liberal arts um, training and the success in the business world. And um, so a few things that, that you're, most of you are liberal arts people that, that probably make more sense to you than they do to some others who are outside of our field is, um, you know, I was trained as a philosopher, um, which meant deconstructing arguments and um, analyzing them and making good ones, separating good ones from bad ones. Um, so that kind of critical thinking and reason judgment um, that it leads to was a great asset in the world. It's a, it's a great asset in any profession, but it's an especially good asset in the world of business. Uh, the, 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 the thing that is most lacking in big business is common sense, right? And um, you get a lot of highly, highly trained MBAs uh, who've done lots of case study analysis and, and um, who cannot easily find their way to a reasonable conclusion about what to do in any particular setting, particular circumstance. So that, I would point to my philosophy training as one of the key assets if, of my liberal arts education. I have an English literature degree, so I've, I'd like to think I'm reasonably articulate and I can make good arguments on paper. I can make succinct arguments, which was another um, really important asset, which is not to ramble on with all due respect to all of the PhDs in this room. And I think, uh, but to be able to summarize things down to one page and to, to make, you know, that's a skill that was honed at Microsoft where and when we got in front of people like Bill Gates, we had five minutes to make our pitch. And so the proverbial elevator pitch. And so um, my facility with languages in general um, helped me kind of concentrate the mind and concentrate the arguments to make them compelling enough um, that people wanted to hear more. And there's a story I tell about the first time I went in front of Bill Gates in 1992, a year after I'd started Microsoft to make the pitch about, um, you know, reducing costs and increasing speed and quality. And um, usually there were six of us. We had to wait, prepare for six months to get in front of him. And we'd be given five minutes, three, three PowerPoint slides and five minutes to make our presentation. And so that really... Um, you know, how can I summarize what I'm trying to do? And it, it was those three, those three parameters. I can reduce costs by 15%. I can increase, you know, decrease um, uh, turnaround times. Localization is, is the process that we use to adapt the software to foreign languages. It's called localization. Um, I can reduce um, the times to accomplish the localizations. I, I can't remember, the, it was something like 25 or 30%. And I can increase quality as well by doing it um, in country rather than here in the U.S. So those three bullet points were up there. And, you know, we'd have five minutes. And if Bill Gates was interested, you might get 10 minutes worth of questions. And, um, you know, my, my, my presentation went well. He started asking questions immediately. And uh, 15 minutes turned into 30 minutes, which turned into an hour. Um, so I figured, okay, I must be doing pretty well. Um, while well, all the other people sitting around the table were, were crestfallen because of course this meant they weren't going to get their turn and they were going to have to wait another X number of months before they could get in front of him. And so that's those two skills, um, being able to communicate effectively, succinctly, um, 
which I got from my English degree, and um, being able to produce reasoned judgments and defend them, in the fe- defend them in, in the face of hostile fire, um, was you know some incredible, truly valuable skills that you actually don't get when you're trained in what you would consider a standard, the standard uh, academic training for a particular. Um, you know, in business school. Now, I'm not saying all business schools. Obviously, there are exceptions, and and there are there are teachers, there are professors who take critical thinking very very seriously and and demand it of their students. But that's a larger discussion. Um, the theology degree, the comparative religions degree at Harvard, gave me a sense that there are things bigger in life than um, the bank account and um, the degrees on the wall and measures you know and degrees on and titles on business cards and so it gave me a sense of the scale of importance of various activities that I was engaged in what was valuable and what was less valuable um, I came back to that. So my journey is really a 40-year journey from, you know, uh, a freshman, very interested in, in spirituality and religion and philosophy and pursu- pursuing the truth with a capital T to this detours through the world of business and, and as an entrepreneur and back to those roots in my 50s. And... Um, now equipped with a certain level of maturity and, of course, all the business experience that I can bear to running this nonprofit. And so that's, that's my story in short, and that's, um, uh, that's why I preach about the value of li- the liberal arts in forming capable, competent individuals who are able to handle any situation that's put before them. Um, I would add that, you know, it's in this this particular age, given so many factors like the high cost of tuition and um, the economic prospects for this these generations, the millennials and generation uh, um, that's that's going to be following um, is the, in, an interdisciplinary focus is is key. And, and so I'm, I'm very much a renaissance person, um, as you'll you'll have probably gathered from my resume and believe that that's the, um, that's what we should educate our um, young people with is um, lots of different influences, lots of different inputs so that they can integrate and come up with um, reasonable command across the board. And so the um, liberal, a liberal arts education is still the best vehicle to deliver on that promise um, and with that said um, that's that's my story and that's why I value um, the liberal arts as highly as I do and I'm hoping uh, that will trigger some questions and some dialogue uh, from all of you yeah Oh, sounds vaguely familiar, but but do go on. So where there um, is, uh, I'll give the firm where you can point to the Bitcoin. Yeah. Like yeah. Smart license to be built in. Yes. Yes. So, so the question uh, was related to my um, to, to to my status as a Zen priest and the notion of two bisons, uh, one doing the hard work, the hard labor, and the other one leading. Um, and and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, and I'm not sure if I got that that completely right. 
It does sound very familiar. It does sound very familiar. So, so the echo for me is, um, you know, organizations, and I'm simplifying um, for for briefness here. Is is organizations need two types of people, right? They need the innovators, creators, disruptors, the the people who the ideas people, right? The people who are saying, well, let's find some new way to do this, or let's go um, in a new direction. And they also need the implementers, the, you know, sometimes I call them the maintenance managers, the people who are actually going to, you know, go, okay, great, great strategy, great conceptual plan, but how are we going to accomplish this? You know, how are we going to get from A to Z? And so um, no organization can run for very long with just one type of person, right? If you have one type, uh, it, it, it lapses into a bureaucracy that's kind of a tribal bureaucracy that's self-sustaining and that doesn't move very fast. It's very conservative by definition uh, because their job is to ensure that protocols are followed, that procedures are implemented and respected and enforced. Um, the disruptors, the innovators, usually have very little time, very, patient, very little patience for that kind of approach. And so they're off kind of freewheeling and whiteboarding and, you know, conceptualizing and reconceptualizing. And um, without some practical grounding, they can't get very far either, right? It's the, the proverbial integration. Both sides of your, your brain work, the right brain or the left brain, are you favoring one more than the other? Kind of by design, not on purpose, usually. Um, and so you need both of those. I would say that... Um, my Zen training to to bring it back there, you know, the the one thing that I could reduce that down to is is um, meditation. And meditation provides fierce focus and fierce um, determination as well, and understanding and insight. Right. So um, combine that focus with natural curiosity. I'm, I'm a Socratic, um, and I insist on it on at the, the organizations that I have run in the past, which is let's have a dialogue. Let's have, you know, you don't like the direction where this is going. Tell me why, why you don't. Tell me, propose some alternatives. And then I'm very clear in my role as a leader that I will make the ultimate decision because someone needs to. And I've learned lots of lessons about leadership along the way. Um, so, um, the, the Zen part gives me focus uh, and determination and insight. And the liberal arts degrees give me critical judgment and sound analysis tools and the ability to deliver and, and render those. So I would say rather than picking one bison or the other is to go with both of them. Yeah. That's right. And so, at the time, you were talking about the people that had the people that were 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 the people yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'll I'll answer both both of those questions. I, I would say I had a number of aha moments. Um, you know, I I I was. Um, very much a Renaissance person, even then, right? I, I was pursuing philosophy because I was pursuing the truth, again, with a capital T. Um, I was pursuing an English degree because I love literature and I love reading and I love writing. And, you know, um, in those days, we were encouraged to just pursue those um, endeavors for their own sake, not with any, you know, what are you going to do with this? Well, you'll become a professor or you'll become a an academic or a writer, and that was good enough to, to keep us going. But 
I also had other passions, right? So I, I, I actually fulfilled the requirements for a political science major, but for some reason they wouldn't give me the triple major. <laughs> and um, so I was always very curious and intrigued by what was going on in lots of different places. And uh, so that Renaissance focus uh, provided many aha moments even then as I was you know, studying philosophy, Western type philosophy and religions and the connections between both of those and political science and Plato and the Republic, the connections between all of those and, you know, the, the philosopher kings and the Supreme Court of the United States and how it was designed and Jefferson and all of those things started to permeate, um, all of those disciplines started to kind of bleed into one another. And um, so I very quickly realized when I started entering, I started my career as a journalist, asking people questions that I didn't want to ask and they didn't want to answer, which means I, I wasn't a very successful journalist. Um, but I did very quickly realize that there were two things that I brought to the table. One was broad range, very curious about how things connect across seemingly disparate um, and, and I would say that the liberal arts education that I received helped me figure out, oh yeah, the, of course there's a connection between marketing and philosophy or, you know, business and, and return on investment in mathematics and science and theology and lots of points of contact. So that was an aha moment. Um, the ability to make, you know, I started to realize, hey, I can make these I can make arguments that are reasonably compelling and people are responding to them. And, um, you know, that became most obvious when I was running the Boston Language Institute first and incredibly obvious when I got to Microsoft, right? Where there were a lot of alpha personalities, very driven, very passionate, very intelligent in their own way, but in a very limited way, right? They, they, they were looking like this. And I had a much broader, broad, I could say, well, what about this? This, this, it's like, well, we're, we're not thinking about that now. I said, well, you should be thinking about it. It's like, well, no, 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 and let's focus in. Um, so, so that was the biggest aha moment. Actually, it helped that, that the person who brought, put me in front of Bill Gates, his name was Peter Newport. Um, you know, one of the things that he had seen in me was, um, you know, young and articulate and you know a good leader i was managing this team and we did some 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 pretty cut, cutting edge things but he also had a philosophy degree and so when he saw a philosophy degree on my resume i think that kind of clinched the deal for him um so th th that those were some of my aha moments and that's why i really think the best thing we can do for our kids these days is this renaissance focus, this cross-disciplinary focus, which means, yes, you want to, you love English literature, go for it. You love philosophy or sociology or psychology, go for it, but inform it with lots of different viewpoints. You know, learn how to cut across um, uh, disciplines and, and disciplinary lines. And that's a big challenge because, you know, all of you who are trained academics know that you're, you go like this, you know, as you go along, you, you get more and more focused and very soon you're at risk of, for mis of missing uh, the, the trees for the forest. Um, so I'd say that's the biggest advice that I can give. And that I have six children of my own. That's the advice that I give them as well. Uh, so the question is, do I have a secret sauce to connect the academic and the business worlds? Um, yes. Yes. The academic world, and you know, it's, it's dangerous to speak in generalities. And so um, I'll put that disclaimer right, right up front, right in front of my response. Um, practical grounding is important. Um, and so as an academic, I think we have, you have, we have to be asking ourselves, what is 
the practical import of these lessons. What is, you know, I'll pick an easy example, right? So Plato is easily translatable because of so many different permutations of his thinking that permeate our, our Western societies. Um, and some others are less obvious, but equally important. What are you going to do with this knowledge? What could you do? Not what are you going to do, but what could you do? You know, stimulating that kind of thought in, in the students, uh, but in ourselves as well, which is, what is the practical relevance of my academic discipline? And so that's what I would say on the academic side. On the business side, it's, um, it's really kind of sim it's similar in terms of the metaphor, which is, you know, going to business school, and I went to business school on the job at Microsoft, right? So I learned kind of by doing and by testing and making mistakes and, and being allowed to, to make different experiments, but also for them to go, you know, analyzing case studies for two years in business school at the grad level is not enough. It's not enough. You have to be able to think. You have to be able to question. You have to be able to reason. And you have to be able to create, not just imitate. And so um, both sides of, so a closer partnership between um, uh, business and the liberal arts is, is something I would encourage. And I think the cross-disciplinary approach on, at a university level, it's alliances between the business school and various departments and creating some joint programs together. Um, and, you know, I could spend all day brainstorming about what those would look like. But that's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Between the two, this well, um, you know, I, 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 this is this kind of this is kind of a throwaway, but it. Bill Gates is not a, you know, is not a college graduate, right? And he did one year of, of college and left in his second year. And um, that's, that hasn't hurt him none in, in any of the fields that he pursues, either in, as a business person, obviously, where he's been a tremendous success, but also in terms of his critical faculties and his intellectual appetite, uh, which is very extensive, very broad. And um, so case, th those kind of case studies to say, look at these individuals and how they have operated and how they have often broken the mold of our expectations, right? It's the outliers that kind of define the field. And then everybody tries to be, become like them. And, um, you know, so, so that's, that's one. There is no formula for success. If there was, then we'd all be. Bill Gates, you know, um, we'll all be hugely financially wealthy people um, if, if that's how we measure our success. Um, so it's, it's out of the box thinking. It's, it's really creative. It's passion and determination. And, and it's also alignment. You know, it's being true to who you are as to who each of us are. And this is what I, I tell the students at every university I go to, and I've been saying it today, and we'll say it tomorrow, and I'm sure until I leave on Friday, um, you know, to listen to that little voice, to not, not, um, to trust yourselves. And um, so to, to those skeptics who are measuring things from the packaging rather than from the essence, who are measuring things by outward forms um, rather than inward essence. And, um, you know, I, I, I would reason with them. I would engage them in dialogue and, um, and of course, be able be willing to walk away and just say, look, I'm just leaving you with these suggestions and uh, see for yourselves if that works or not. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> Yeah. So it sounded to me that you had just actually done a very good thing, or you were hiding, right? Like, 
Yeah. 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 So, so the question was to reflect on, on my Bill Gates moment, um, or mo one of the moments, which was this presentation that kind of transformed my career. Um, and, and what skills did I acquire from my liberal arts um, education that enhanced that moment, as opposed to just making a kind of return on investment presentation. Um, Bill Gates is a thinker. I mean, he's, he has um, um, a, a, a mind like a razor blade and um, incisive, penetrating, and dangerously bloody and potentially bloody if you're not prepared. And so he loved engaging in dialogue. He loved engaging in questions. He would ask um, provocative, challenging, and aggressive questions. And, you know, I, I had Socratic training, right? So I wasn't easily phased by being challenged that way. In fact, I, I, for me, it was like, oh, good, you know, you. You want to get into this? Let's. Let, I, I saw that as a positive sign, and I was right. Even though many of my colleagues were intimidated into silence, um, he was a very commanding and and powerful presence and powerful intellect, as I mentioned. And so, the training that I received in Socratic dialogue allowed me to take the opportunity to engage with him for what it was and to not be cowed or intimidated by um, his questioning. You know, I'd, I'd read Plato. I know that I knew how the system works, right? And said, the more provo pro provocative the questioning, the better. And the more it allows us to get to the, to the, to the essence of the matter and, and to see whether the matter has any essence. And so um, that is, I don't usually speak about that, that particular aspect. So thank you for that question. But I would say that was one key, uh, the ability to engage in dialogue uh, gave me a significant like up at that moment in time. So he wanted to see that too. <laughs> he wanted to see the data too. Um, but you know, because it was, there wasn't a lot of precedent for it at Microsoft, he also needed to, to be convinced that um, there was a reasonable chance of success. And of course, I knew what I, you know, I knew the risk I was running, which is the, you know, if I didn't start to deliver results within six to 12 months, I'd, I'd be out of a job. And uh, so anyway, with that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Six children. Yes, um, ages 14 to 33, five, five boys and one girl, yeah. Yes. Alternative training. Well, I mean, I, I teach them all to be critical thinkers. And, and of course, there's a huge difference between the 33-year-old and the 14-year-old, because even in that 20-year, uh, age difference um, is is a phenomenal distance now. Um, critical thinking is not going to go out of style, and they're really you know it's one of the sad commentaries of. And again, I'm in in the realm of generalities here of education in our country that um, critical thinking, which should be the default, is not that it's more kind of rote memorization and repetition and kind of unquestioning absorption, which turns many of our kids into spectators to their own education rather than participants in it um, and actors, spectators rather than actors. And so um, 
you know, I, I use, I try to use examples that are relevant to each of my children, depending on their particular interests. Um, and so far, they're all, you know, firmly in the liberal arts camp. And, um, and that's fine by me. I mean, that's, that's you know, it's, of course, it's entirely up to them what they, what they do with their lives. But, um, you know, I try to speak in their language. And, and I think that's important. You know, my daughter, who is 14, the youngest one, has a very different way of looking at the world than, than her brothers. And so in order to connect with her, yes, I, you know, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I grew up with, with loud music, so it doesn't phase me when she cranks the rap music in, in, at home. And so I can communicate with her in a way that my parents couldn't communicate with me around issues like that. And it's, it's a simple, it's a kind of a translation trick, but it's being able to engage with people at, and this is also part of my Zen training, which is upaya, you know, skillful means being able to engage with your audience at whatever level they are. And um, so that's important. And then, you know, then it's questions and answers and questions and answers and encouraging her and encouraging her brothers to ask more questions and more questions and never be satisfied until they've really thought it through from 12 different perspectives and go, are you sure that you really feel this way now? And um, yes, you know, I've made a decision. I've made an informed decision that this is my stance on this particular issue. And I've got good, that, you know, that's, that's the point. And of course, if there's new evidence that comes in that, that um, dislodges that understanding, then you should shift and alter your thinking. And that's both a Buddhist perspective and, and a perspective that Western philosophy gives us. So that's what I try to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, not so much anymore. Not so much anymore because I really believe that, you know, if you pull on any thread long and hard enough, the whole universe kind of comes behind it. And um, even if it's a mis mistake, a mistaken thread, the, the extent of your mistake will be revealed by pulling on the thread. And then that mistake becomes a learning opportunity, which actually becomes the pathway to, to, to pulling on the right thread or the easier thread to accomplish whatever goal you've set for yourself. So um, I'm not afraid to make mistakes. And um, along with that, I'm also not afraid to course correct. Um, I know that our intentions in the world of business are ne never come anywhere near the realities that manifest and unfold and that the key to being successful is to follow the thread where it wants to go, not where you want it to go. Um, and so that that's, relates to a much larger topic about control, right? I mean, I, I used to think in my 20s and 30s that I could control outcomes by being very de deliberate about the input points. Um, I now believe that you can have an intention that you throw out there, but that if you want to see manifestation, you have to be aligned with the flow of that particular direction, and you have to be willing to constantly course correct and adjust. Um, so because I'm not afraid to make mistakes, I usually will pick the grapes over the bananas. <laughs> yeah. So the question was, um, since I, um, or what was my appreciation of working globally, of uh, some lessons learned from um, the international perspective uh, that I've acquired? Is that right? Yeah. So that's, that's um, you know, I, I kind of alluded to it earlier, which is, you know, growing up as the son of an Indian man and a, and, a, and a woman from Spain in Belgium and then in the States uh, with different languages and different cultures, always traveling, always adapting, um, 
it gave me some chameleon like abilities right to shift yeah, to shift direction to shift language and, and language is not just spoken language but cultural languages um body language learning how to read people by how they manifest physically in front of in front of me and so the ability to shift languages is is um is probably the biggest perspective that i that i brought i i went to japan in 93 with microsoft to run a um basically a revolution around how Japanese Microsoft software was produced. We had a large, um, you know, KK Japanese team in, in Tokyo, and they would take a full two years after the U.S., the English version was released to come up with a Japanese version. And the arguments were constantly, well, you know, in Japan, we care a lot more about quality. And so it takes us a long time to you know, just get it right. And you don't understand this, you gaijin, you foreigners, you don't understand this, so let us be. Let us do what we're going to do. And most of the executives from Microsoft who would come, would come and make some big show, and then they would leave. And the Japanese would just go back to doing the things the way they, they had been trained to do it. So I had, <clears throat> I did a lot of martial arts um, as, a, as a young man and... Um, you know, my Zen training began very early when I was age 17, when I was a freshman. And so I had quite a bit of exposure to Japanese culture and I studied Japanese language as well. And, you know, I was fortunate. I had some fantastic professors at Harvard who were very steeped in uh, uh, Japanese culture. And so, you know, I went to KK in 1993 and I said, uh, you know, I was the, the, the anointed, uh, anointed Puba from, from headquarters um, over there to set, the, to, to set them straight. I said, well, we're going to have to release these products simultaneously, not, not only not two years after, but you're going to have to release them on the same day as the English. And uh, no more, you know, no more monkeying around, no more um excuses and and pretexts and of course i was in a room with you know maybe 30 senior uh japanese manager and after i finished my presentation you know they were basically all hi right like yes and i knew enough about japanese culture to know that um that particular yes means yes we heard what you said not yes we're going to comply with it um, and I also knew how things were done. So, you know, the full day's worth of meetings, and then we would go to dinner, and at 11 o'clock at night, the, you know, bottles of whiskey would come out, and by 2 o'clock in the morning, they were telling you what you, you know, what they actually thought, and uh, what they thought would be possible and not possible. And so, um, and I kept coming back. You know, I, I, every month or every other month, I was back in Japan. I would engage with them repeatedly, during their time hours, um, even from Seattle. And so they saw that I wasn't going away. They saw that I had an appreciation for Japanese, a sincere appreciation for Japanese culture and understanding of it and respect for it. And so they started to come around very quickly. And so that's one example of many, but it basically, um, that ability to kind of speak to people, even though I didn't speak and don't speak fluent Japanese by any means, um, I was able to connect with them in a way that made them feel heard, respected, and still able to respond to my request for change. Yeah. Yeah. So is the question about the in in a short attention span world the integration between Yeah. Right, with, with the time that it requires to, to become educated. Um, 
Yes, because I think you can you can provide little s snippets, right? You can you can provide bites of the apple, um, and you know how. Again, back to your earlier question about what is you know what is the practical consequence of this lesson on the republic? What is the impact of Plato's thinking on how the Supreme Court is constituted? If you want to be a you know a lawyer. How do you understand it? And you can do that on one level, you know, somewhat superficially, very quickly. And then you can spend, you know, 10 years writing a dissertation about it and a lifetime studying it and, and lecturing on it and kind of unpacking all sorts of hidden meanings. And so I think, uh, I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And I think, uh, I think um, we can operate both on a compressed offering like here's a little here's a little tapas here's a little appetizer for you and if you want the main dish then come back for it and come back with a deeper commitment and a deeper willingness to engage knowing that it's going to take that level of depth and immersion to really understand what's going on that you're but you but you can still have an appetizer and and try it out that way so I, th I think we're probably reaching our time. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. This is more of the Zen thing, not the Zen thing. So, yeah. Uh, I'm very taken by a book by Michael Post called Time Stunner and the Burning Man. And it's mm -hmm. very fascinating. I think you visit some type of sequence for the beginning as a sort of zero sum game. Absolutely. Right? It's about power, it's about high weight food. Yep. Sure. Sure. And, and since we're talking about Japan, I mean, as soon as you, you ask that question, I'm, I'm reminded of the 100-year the corporate plan, right, that most Japanese companies have, which is they think over generations, over several generations in terms of their business planning, but that doesn't stop them from making the decision that needs to be made today about, you know, I don't know, product X. And um, it... it provides a larger framework for the values that they want to pass on from one generation to the next, the values that they want their employees to uh, avail themselves of as they are building products or delivering um, offerings to their consumers. So that, that there's that larger framework that kind of resides in the background, but it doesn't prevent the, again, back to the, the to the, kind of one of the themes of the day, which is what is the practical consequence of all of this company philosophy or company orientation, company values? What does that mean as you do your job today? And that's very much a Zen lesson, right? Which is, you know, you become enlightened, you go up in the mountain. So before you go up the mountain, you're, you know, scrubbing the floors and cleaning the toilet. And after you become enlightened, come back down the mountain, you're scrubbing the floors and cleaning the toilet, right? There's still, that stuff still needs to be done. And even though your perspective has changed on it, it still needs to be done. And so I think that's, um, that's the analogy I would give you in response to your question. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you.